Hi everyone, my name is Marin Beck, I am from Zagreb and I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Kraken, which is an, basically an IT agency specialized in distributed systems, complex systems, more or less clients come to us when they need a problem solved. On the other hand, I'm also co-founder and CEO of Ascalia, which is a spin-off project of ours at Kraken, which is a smart city platform and industry 4.0 platform that we started this year. But I'm not a programmer, actually. I started out as an electrical engineer, and I worked in automotive industry, originally on systems for modeling and simulation of car engines, car parts, and things like that. And that was boring, honestly, so I decided to make my first startup, which was doing underwater drones. Uh, I went to the US. I went to the US. I started a company there uh, with some people, got some investments, and we started to do this underwater vehicles for the industry. But you have to keep in mind that this was seven years ago. So there were no uh, drones, there was no DJI. And I was a youngster, kind of, and uh, sorry, the company was there. But what happened is that it uh, went bust. Uh, but it was a great learning experience. And the main point is that I was there. I was in, I was in Silicon Valley. So very early on, I was involved with all the startup culture, entrepreneurship got emerged into all this buzz that's now also here in Croatia and in uh, Eastern and Western Europe. And that's how I got involved with uh, my next startup where I was uh, working, which is Next User. Um, next User is a marketing automation platform that delivers one-on-one -on -one personalization for each client worldwide in real time. And we do that for, okay, I need to move closer. Uh, we do that for big clients like Fortune 500 people. So our list of clients include L'Oreal, Unilever in Singapore, uh, Purina, like dog food and cat food, and one of my favorites, Nutella. And this is what this talk is about. Um, we will discuss how we deliver this content to these clients, actually their end users on their websites. And to clarify, we do not make the websites themselves. We actually don't do any websites. We only do the content delivery to the existing websites. So for example, when a client like L'Oreal comes to us, they already have an existing website. They have existing development team, but what they lack is this ability to deliver personalized content to each and every customer. And that's what we do. So let us start. It started in the US, obviously. Then we had clients in Europe. After that, we got clients in Asia. Then we got more clients in the US. And we got clients in Brazil. And finally, we had also clients in uh, Mexico. And as you can see, it's a problem if you want to deliver real-time, one-on-one data to all these people all over the world. Because it's no longer that you're delivering just uh, static content. So CDNs like Cloudflare are not enough for this you need to actually compute things for each and every person without uh, shitting up their experience. Because your clients, the companies, will be very unhappy if people start complaining or leaving their website just because you slowed it down. But we'll start with some basics. As we all know, each... Sorry. Uh, each uh, application, in the simplest manner, is a single app. We will not do the distinction between backend and frontend for the sake of simplicity. Let's just say that you have one app, you have one project which is delivering some content. But that's usually not so much fun and it doesn't give actual uh, benefit to everyone. So you hook up a database. Once you hook up a database, then you're starting to get real. Now you can store data from your clients, you can process it, you can give some meaningful data back to the clients, etc. At that point, you realize that not maybe all of your code belongs into this one app. You have stuff that you want to do in the behind. You want to do analytics. You want to do different uh, reports. You need to pre-compute maybe things. That's when you introduce another layer in your application, which we will call in this presentation a background worker. This can be anything. 
most commonly in marketing. This is obviously analytics, data crunching, and things like that. And this is all great. Now you have a pr proper project. You and your friends, we, you put together this thing. It's all still on a single server. So it's all just one little box that runs happily. And then you decide you'll post on Hacker News. And the worst thing possible happens, you hit front page, and uh, basically your application goes kaboom. It doesn't work because all of this load, it crashed your application, and now you need to figure out what to do, how you will support, instead of 10 users, 10,000 users at the same time. And first and logical step is to uh, take your application, take your system actually, and decouple it. You need to identify which parts make logical groups that you can decouple onto different services or and different servers. And first part that you do is you take your database, you put it on another server. Why do you start usually with a database? Well, it's because of the na nature on how databases work. So databases, by default, they usually mess up with your disk writes. They take a lot of memory if you don't know how to index properly. Uh, they take a lot of CPU time. So you separate them on a different uh, process. What is, what is the problem in this uh, approach? Problem starts being here. So problem start, prob real problems start once you uh, introduce network into your system. I'm not talking about network between your application and users, the internet. I'm talking about network between different parts of your system. Because there is no uh, computer system on this planet that is impervious to network issues. It happens constantly. We have next user for the last, last six years. Twice there was a data center outage on AWS. Two, three times it, there was a data center outage on Google Cloud. Recently there was an issue on Hetzner where some stuff blew up. So you cannot count on your network being always available. You, you need to solve this problem. So you need to solve an issue when this line stops being a line, when it breaks. And there are some theoretical knowledges that are useful when you try to solve this problem. How many of you know what cap theorem is? One, two, three, four, okay. Maybe I should have made a basic talk. So what is a cap theorem? Cap theorem uh, is basically this Venn diagram from 1998 from, I believe, University of Berkeley, um, which says that you cannot have it all. This theorem basically says that in your systems you cannot have everything. You need to choose, you need to make uh, some kind of compromise. So, you have consistency. What is consistency? Consistency means um, that in your database, in your data source, whenever someone writes something, he will get that read out, that there it will not be a case when, I don't know, John writes something, Paul reads it, and they get different things for the same data set. That's consistency. What is availability? Well, that's quite straightforward. It basically means that whatever happens, your users will always get something. They will never encounter an error. So if you have a database and the database goes down, this is called non-availability. Non and finally, partition tolerance. Um, there's, one th there's this thing that's called split brain. So if you have a system that uh, consi consists of different parts, what happens when you cut the connection between them? You get a split brain. Both systems can work still. Imagine you take your app, you put it on one server and on another server, and they talk over a wire. That's one system. Once the wire cuts, they still work, but they don't talk to each other. This is a split brain. And partition tolerance says that your system will still work fine, even with partition tolerance. Now, there is one misconception about this cap theorem. And this misconception, misconception says um, that uh, you need to choose two out of three, which is basically a fallacy. So yes, as you can see, uh, there is no place where this three the circles cross all together, so obviously you need to choose two. But uh, cap theorem is there for one simple reason, and that reason is what happens when I get partition uh, breakage. So what happens when I get a split brain? And this is the problem that you need to solve. This problem was, this theorem was born 
out of the fact that our database can get disconnected. And this theorem is primarily for databases. One other thing that you need to keep in mind is that CAP theorem is not the same as ACID um, principle in databases. It's different things, so don't mix that up. This on CAP theorem covers only what will you do with your database or your system if your database gets disconnected. So what happens when a part of the network breaks? And that's the point where you need to choose whether you will choose A or B, whether you will choose consistency or you will choose availability. There is no one answer to this problem. It depends strictly on your system. It, de it depends on your problem, on, the, on your uh, business case. Because um, let's say uh, you're doing a banking system. Do you want availability or do you want uh, consistency? Well, if you have a bank and you choose availability, it basically means that your ATM will never be down, which is great, but you're sacrificing consistency. Let's say that you have an ATM for the same bank in Zagreb and in Split, and there's a network issue between them. They're both functioning, but they're not talking to each other or the central bank. What will happen? If you have a real fast car, you go to Zagreb, you withdraw a thousand euros, you go to Split, you withdraw a thousand euros, and the system didn't stop you. So you have availability, but there is no synchronization between the parts of the system that got uh, partitioned, and you have a problem. Sorry. This is why banks always choose consistency. What if, 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 if there is one thing that banks need, that's the ability to know when you spent money so that you cannot spend it anymore. On the other hand, and next users, for example, case, which is a marketing automation, no one cares about consistency. Why? Because, for example, one of our clients, Care4, which is successful agrocore in France, um, they have something like 300 million active users per month. 300 million. Does Care4 care if we tell them, you know, you had uh, 10 million 71 purchases or you had 10 million 72 purchases. They don't care because marketing is a business of volume. So whenever you look at marketing statistics like uh, or online branding statistics, it's always percentages. It's just a trend that's being looked at. You do not look at actual numbers. But does care for want their website to be down? Does consume click want their web shop to be down? Absolutely not. They do not want to sacrifice their uh, money on, uh, just because your system failed. So in marketing, you most probably choose availability over consistency. If there is some data uh, delay, it doesn't matter. I hope this is now a bit clearer. So now, previously, we had this situation. We had one database, one cable. Cable dies, your application doesn't get data, so your you are suffering from partitioning, but not only that you're suffering for partitioning, your application will no longer know what to serve its clients. First and simplest, seriously. First and simplest solution is master-slave replication for your database. What does this mean? This means that you have one database still, and you have basically a backup. And this is this part here. So you get a real database that you use normally, which is connected with a wire to your application. Then you have another database that's connected also to your application, preferably in a different location, in a different server room, in a different availability zone in AWS. So it's the same data center, different building, different power. If this data center goes kaboom, this one takes over. And you just have a link between them that makes sure that they synchronize data. In this case, you, are, you get availability but you do not get concurrency because this part here actually doesn't work always and it doesn't work perfectly, especially if you have automatic recovery and things like that. But it's a start. To do it better, you introduce something more complex. For example, on next user, we introduced the master-master replication using Galera clustering. What is this? You basically put at least three servers and you connect them in a circle, let's say, figuratively speaking. And what does this circle do? You get the same data on all three databases, 
or more, but at the same time, you put some kind of a load balancer uh, in front of them. Your application just automatically gets transferred to whichever database is either closest or which database is uh, least uh, encumbered by requests or which one is working actually. Why three? Well, number three is chosen because um, if you have two people in a room and you ask them for opinion on A or B, you, you are risking that you will not know who is right. You will not know who is lying. If you have three people in the room and give them two options, then you get quorum. In that case, there is no case when it can happen that three people will you, tell you any combination of answers in which you don't know what's true. And that's the same thing with clustering. So you put at least three databases, or five, or seven. You never put an equal number. You only put odd numbers. And by doing that, uh, you achieve the following. Let's assume that this server went down. What happens with your application? Nothing. It just gets rerouted to this and this database, and it works, and works fine. Your DevOps gets an alert. This database is down. Check what it is, blah, blah, blah. They fix it at some point. Once this database gets online, it synchronizes automatically with the other databases. And this is not true only for Galera. This is true for different types and different implementations of Master Master. You don't, uh, it, it's really just a matter of taste what you will use. There isn't much, uh, you know, it's more a good old flame war what you will choose. But the main point is that this database will synchronize in once they together determine that, okay, this is the now fine, it gets back online. Also, what this type of a system allows you is uh, whenever you ask for some data, databases figuratively vote. If you ask, what's the latest blog post by John, the two databases will say it's the yesterday blog post, the third one will say it's the one last week. What will happen, you will get served the one from yesterday because two out of three, and the third one will get synchronized and up to date. This way, you are, not, uh, you are not totally consistent because they're not synchronized constantly, but you get availability and you ensure that you will in any case get some data. Let's get back to how the whole system looks like. So, uh, we have now a system all over our beautiful planet, but in the talk so far, we didn't cover actually this problem of distributed system. We only solved the first problem and that's availability of your data. You, you notice that I said that all of those three or more databases you put in different locations, but normally you wouldn't put them on each continent because then you introduce other issues like lag and it will be a problem to synchronize between them. What you will do is you will achieve availability of your data in a single place basically but still it's not available, uh, it's not distributed, sorry. Uh, if you want to do distributed, you need to be close to your customers. And how do you know where to be or what to do? You need to measure, and that's the first point, even before you start considering distributing your application. You need to know where to put it, what to put, and how much to put. That's why before you do any optimization, in general, not just when you're doing distributed systems, measure. Uh, take those 10% of development time and introduce some metrics. Identify what's the pain point for your system and measure it and display it on some Grafana, put it on a wall, just so you have some data. Because otherwise you're blind, you don't know what you're actually optimizing. At Next User, um, we deal with brands that are worldwide, which means uh, visitors from all over the world go to these websites and you need to know how many people visit Nutella site. I don't know. Do Americans visit Nutella site? Turns out not. Do Asians visit it? Turns out yes. So you need to know this data in advance. If you just ask someone about this data, they will probably lie. It's inherent to people to lie and if you ask business people, it will definitely be a lie. You need to measure it and you need to know what's the truth. And that's what we did. We decided where we need to put our servers based on the fact what data we got. We decided 
how big servers we need to put based on the data we got. Why do we have two data centers in uh, US? Well, because a lot of clients, a lot of clients and users are from the US. And even that 90 milliseconds from coast to coast in latency meant a lot. If you're doing real time distributed systems, then this uh, be close to your users is even more critical. Because if you're doing one-on-one -on -one personalization like we do for people on the website, it literally means when people type in uh, L'Oreal.com, they get served different ads, different discounts, different products than their friends. And uh, in order to do that, you need to do it in that split second while you are answering them. And for that to work fine, it needs to be fast. And in order to be fast, you need to reduce all sources of uh, lag. That's why you put it close. Because just going cross ocean, uh, US uh, and Europe, it's around one 150 milliseconds. And if you add on top of that some processing, some database uh, queries or something like that, you will start uh, lagging your clients. You will start lagging their users and you will lose your work. In order to tackle that problem, uh, you start adding scaling. This time you don't add scaling for the sake of managing more requests. You add scaling, horizontal scaling, for the sake of being distributed. At the same time, you of course handle more requests, but the point of uh, scaling going horizontally on distributed systems is actually to be able to be close to your clients. But how to know, uh, how will uh, your website or how will your user's browser know uh, to which application to go, to which background worker to go to get this content? It's quite simple, actually. Uh, it's using DNS. There's such thing as that's called uh, geographic DNS, GeoDNS, where uh, the DNS server doesn't reply just here, here are the servers and go home. No, it looks what was the lag here. So when the user, wherever he is, asks a uh, DNS server, hey, give me L'Oreal.com's IP address, uh, the DNS server measures what was the latency between the user and the DNS server. Based on that, it knows where approximately he is and which of the servers will be the closest to him. And then it serves him with a that IP address. And that's how you can handle very easily and very stupidly, actually, uh, distribution. You just go to AWS, you use their, for example, uh, root 53, put in your IPs or attach instances or whatever, and it works automatically, basically. And that's what we did. After that, all of your background workers can still connect to the same database, effectively. But this depends also on your use case. Um, sometimes you want this, sometimes you don't want this. In case of, for example, next user and marketing automation, we didn't have to put database in each location. If we did that, first, my DevOps team would hate me. Second, uh, we would spend a lot of money, so business team would hate me. And developers would hate me because they would need to code more. So everyone would hate you, and you don't need that. You just need to smartly uh, design your system. Because, as I said earlier, you don't care about uh, consistency in such a system. You only care about availability. The only goal when you're doing distributed real-time systems is that this part here needs to be fast. That's the only thing that needs to be fast. This here, not so much. You don't care. Why? Because if someone buys something this moment, do you really need that data in immediately? No. You need that data once someone will want to do analytics, get a report or something. And then you solve it simply. You just say, OK, users, my like clients, you will get reports updated every five minutes, 10 minutes, 30, one day, doesn't matter. If you ever used Google Analytics, you can see the exactly same thing. You never see all the data, especially if you're big. When you are big, when you have a lot of data in Google Analytics, they actually cut down on the data. They give you a downsampled report, unless you pay 100K per year for a license to premium something. Uh, but you just get the volume. You just uh, get uh, quality reports. You don't get quantitative. 
as I said, you don't get exact number of purchases, you get what is thought to be exact number of purchases based on a subset of data. And that's what we do as well. So data lands in the database at some later point. Seriously. Okay. Um, in order to decouple this part of storing data and processing it in the background somewhere far, far away, uh, you need to decouple your application more. We started out with one web application. We continued with uh, adding a background worker on each application. And then after that, we introduced um, distribution and we said that we don't need this background work constantly at the same time. So what do we do? You take those background workers here and you put them somewhere else. Since background workers for your analytics uh, need to talk to your database quite, quite a bit actually, you probably want to put them in the same data center. If you need uh, availability of this data, uh, these background workers so that the uh, job doesn't uh, queue up, so it doesn't get uh, overwhelming, you can also scale it, you can put it parallel, you can uh, horizontally scale it, you can do whatever, but you keep it in one location or in a few data centers, but you do not put it in every location. How do you get the data from the user side back to the background side? Well, you just put queues. Um, I hope most of you know what queues are. Who doesn't know what a queue is? Okay, good, then I don't need to explain. So you just Take the data, shove it in a queue, whatever you want. It doesn't matter really, really. Like if you start having a discussion with people which queuing methodology is the best, you will get again into a flame war. Personally, I implemented zero MQ. Now a lot of you think, oh, you're complicating things. Well, my background was in socket programming, so zero MQ was fine for me. I didn't care. Um, it was seven years ago, so some of the technology you're thinking about now didn't exist. So I went with zero MQ and it's still there and it's still functioning. Is it complex to implement? Maybe. Uh, is it good? Yes. It, does it work? <laughs> yes. Uh, you want to go with Rabbit? Go with Rabbit, Kafka, MQTT, whatever. For example, in Ascalia, in the Smart City solution, we didn't implement zero MQ. We use MQTT. Um, but the point is that you just need to decouple your system. So you have your application, you shove it in a queue and you don't care what happens later because that's uh, that's the business case. Okay. Well, we now uh, covered the distribution. Now we are left with the real time. How to do real time? Uh, it's simple. Don't touch your disk, don't touch your network, and do everything in memory. That's the only proper way to do real time. As soon as you start scraping on disks, looking for data, God forbid, uh, doing queries on a cluster, you're not doing real time. You are n you're not doing anything because you lost all your contracts, um, especially if you have a database in one location. So you need to be smart about how you will actually deliver this real-time uh, system. What we did in Next User is uh, data comes in, data goes back, data gets processed into the database. That's the part with data acquisition and pre-processing. What do marketeers do? What do our clients like L'Oreal, Nestle, et cetera, do? They make some um, campaign. They say, for example, whoever spends more than three minutes on the website and didn't buy a chair, give him a 10% discount on a chair. This gets processed by other background workers. So the things start getting complex. And then we just shove it in what we call real-time workers. Uh, what are real-time workers? Well, that's basically a uh, distributed, again, s set of processes that sit next to each uh, client-facing application. So how many client-facing applications, how many locations in the world we have, that's how many real-time workers we have. Why? To reduce latency. You want to do real-time, it needs to be fast. You cannot put it in one location and then wait half a second for this to travel from San Francisco to Singapore. So we put it there and we use some kind of in-memory database, Redis, whatever, but uh, you do not touch the database. And then you directly communicate 
in on the same server between the user facing application and the uh, real time worker and then you just need to plan ahead that's what we do since uh, users are uh, on average less than four minutes on every website especially on e-commerce sites you need to act fast and we cannot wait for this loop here to be done first of all because we don't count on availability here anywhere we just want it to be done whenever so you cannot count on that when you're doing real time but you need to plan in advance so our analytics part it calculates what are theoretical paths of the user in their journey on the website and tells that to the real-time worker so when John lands here on the website the user facing application asks the real-time worker hey John is here then we know in memory okay who the John who John is and then a real-time worker knows okay if he will st stay more than three minutes and won't buy a chair give him a discount this part here knows that in memory and then it just tells the user side okay for now don't do anything the next time user clicks on something on the website or browses or looks at something the real-time worker already knows when he came on which page he landed and in, in advance without getting the data from background it knows what's the next step and that's basically how we do real time at uh, next user in marketing it's quite simple you just need to plan in advance and again it depends on the use case in our case we didn't uh, have the option of uh, waiting long we need to act fast so that's how we did it <coughs> finally I'll just show a high overview of the next user architecture which you will see it's quite sim similar to what I showed you earlier so we have a bunch of uh, user facing servers in all over the world then we have the zero MQ which talks to two people on one side it talks to background stuff on the other it talks to the real-time uh, services and then on in the background of course we don't have one service we have a bunch of them and then we have the analytics which also is actually a bunch of services and then you have the Galera cluster it doesn't matter three seven eight actually eight matters uh, and finally you have the user our end user uh, facing application which is the platform where the marketeers work you will notice that this part it's a single server it, there's a one web interface there's one database why because next user doesn't have a lot of clients it has maybe 20 clients and each of those clients has maybe three people three marketeers that click it do we need parallel processing for that no do we need uh, high availability for our marketing solution no if there is downtime hey users there's downtime we never have a thousand people clicking on our platform so here there is no parallelism there's no need for it to conclude uh, do not optimize early uh, we are all engineers and we all like to optimize early because it's fun it's a challenge especially if you have a colleague on another team that likes to optimize and then you're like haha I can process a thousand requests per second no but I can process a thousand one and a half thousand requests per second and then you just ask them how many users do we have well none then you're optimizing early and you're wasting time don't do that uh, measure before you optimize and monitor of course if you are not measuring if you're not monitoring your system you have no idea what's going on you don't know whether you need to optimize when do you need to optimize what's going on so just measure and uh, use that to your advantage uh, use measuring to identify your bottlenecks um, as I described not every system has the same bottlenecks our system has one bottleneck banking system has another bottleneck you need to identify what's your pain point what's your bottleneck and uh, decouple your processes uh, you don't want to put everything everywhere you need to identify what's actually critical what's not critical and just what's not critical put it somewhere else put it on a single server or two don't put it all over the world don't uh, distribute everything save your time save your resources save your DevOps's uh, sense uh, of sanity don't do everything and avoid centralization uh, this goes not only for distributed systems this goes in general don't put all your bags or all, all your eggs in one basket uh, don't introduce yourself 
uh, with uh, single points of failure just because you will suffer sooner or later because of that. There's so many technologies out there today that allow you to do simple parallelization or high availability. Don't, don't uh, shoot yourself in the leg too early. And keep it simple. Um, this goes back to the optimization stuff. Don't overcomplicate it. Uh, don't get drawn into different uh, flame wars and similar things, which technology is better. Use what you are most familiar with. Use, you want Ruby, use Ruby. You want Python, use Python. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Thank you. We have uh, plenty of time for questions, so who has questions? Uh, I'll ask you, um, how do I how do I convince my developers? I'm a I'm a product manager. How do I convince my developers to not build all this stuff while we only have a thousand clients or we're doing you know yeah. the start of the project because they want to plan all this out now and yeah. we don't need it now. So how do I how do I stop that? Well, I I, I learned that two things uh, and now my developers are laughing at me, smiling at me. Uh, two things work in this case. One thing is show them the backlog so they see there's actual work to be done. And the other thing is ask them how many users do we have? They usually stop asking after that. Hi there. Hi. Hi. So I have a question. Uh, somewhere at the start or the middle, you, uh, you talked about a little bit about database mirroring. Uh, I'm interested whether you are using mirroring on the level of a database provider or you are using uh, some service such as Amazon RDS, which is geo-redundant by service. <laughs> yeah, so no, we don't use Amazon RDS. And the uh, reason for that is quite simple. Uh, when you're a startup, each cloud provider gives you $100,000 every year to go to them. Uh, so you don't want to get uh, vendor locked. Uh, so what we did is uh, we have a team that manages our database. It works the same. So RDS is essentially the same thing, just you point and click instead of doing it yourself. If you can uh, use out of the service, uh, out of the box services, by all means, I am always for that. Uh, if you have a team of seven DevOps, they will probably not like that. They want to play with their toys. So that's also fine. It depends on your case. <laughs> 